How did you do this week in your walk of faith? Don't answer that out loud. If you were to give yourself a letter grade, A, B, C, D, or F like was on my report cards, if you were to give yourself a letter grade, how did you do this week in your walk of faith? And I ask that for personal reflection. Look in the mirror and ask that person, an answer to that person, how you did in your walk of faith. As we study Second Chronicles on Wednesday nights, I'm, I'm reminded of King Rehoboam. Most of us know King David and his relationship with God. Most of us know of King Solomon and his relationship with God. But many of us don't know about King Rehoboam and his relationship with God. David, his son Solomon, and then Rehoboam is Solomon's son and David's grandson. Book of 2 Chronicles chapter 12 talks a little bit about Rehoboam. Verse 1, after Rehoboam's position as king was established and he had become strong, he and all Israel with him abandoned the law of the Lord. They abandoned the law of the Lord. Now, to abandon something means to throw it aside and leave it with no intention of going back to it. You and I have driven down the road and we've seen an abandoned car alongside the road. We've seen abandoned couch, mattress, and all kinds of other stuff alongside the road. Stuff that people just throw out. What people do, and this is just trifling, they'll put their junk in the back of a truck and about Two o'clock in the morning, they'll drive out on, on, on the road when there's nobody around and throw the junk out there, abandon it. Just nasty. But that's what I want you to have in mind when you think of the word abandon. Some people abandon pets. They take them out to the country and just leave them with no intention of going back to them. When he says that Rehoboam abandoned the law of the Lord, that's what he did with it. He threw God's law aside with no intention of going back back to it. Verse 2, because they did this, because they abandoned the law of the Lord, because they were unfaithful, the Lord sent Shishak, who at that time was king of Egypt, and he attacked Jerusalem. Then the prophet Shammai came to Rehoboam and to the leaders of Judah, and he said to them, this is what the Lord says, you have abandoned me, so now I will abandon you. You've got to be at a bad place in your life, in your relationship with God, for God to say, I will abandon you. We've got to work hard for God to say, I will abandon you. Look throughout the scripture how God repeats himself over and over and over again, pleading with man, please do right. Yeah. Please do right. Please do right. God does it again. There are many times in the scripture when God says, don't do this. If you do this, I'm going to punish you. And then he does not punish. God demonstrates his grace on so many occasions in so many different ways. So it takes a whole lot for God to say, you've abandoned me. So I'm going to abandon you as well. I'm going to leave you along the roadside with no intention of going back to you. Verse 6, the leaders of Israel and the king, they humbled themselves. And they said, the Lord is just. The Lord is right for what he's doing to us. When the Lord, this is what I love about God, verse 7, when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, when the Lord saw the humility of their heart, this word of the Lord came to Shemaiah the prophet. Since they have humbled themselves, I will not destroy them. Now, when my mother promised me and my brothers a, a beating, you can bet your last money, a beating had jumped on the train, it's on its way, it's coming. And usually when God promised, it was the same way. But I love verse 7, when God saw the humility of their heart, when they acknowledged to God, we've done wrong. God, we've been trifling. When God saw that, he relented. He said, I will not destroy them, but I will 
give them into the hands of Shishak. God said, I'm not going to do what I said I was going to do, but I'm still going to punish them. Why? In verse 8, so that they may learn obedience. So that they may learn obedience. Verse 12, because Rehoboam humbled himself, the Lord's anger turned from him, and he was not totally destroyed. Indeed, there was some good in Judah. Isn't God amazing? Keep in mind now, he's talking about his children who know the right they should do. And God looks at our lives and he looks through all the mess in our lives to try to find some goodness. Even when we're bent and determined to do what's wrong, God still looks in our lives with a microscope to try to find something good in our lives. Verse 14, the Bible says, he did evil because he did not set his heart on seeking the Lord. He did not set his heart. If we do not make up our minds and hearts, if we do not firmly decide that I'm going to serve the Lord no matter what, no matter what happens in my life, no matter what good comes in my life, no matter what bad comes in my life, if we don't have that kind of determination, then when trials come, when hardship comes, we also will abandon the Lord. Now, God had promised to bless each of David's generation. He said, you will always have an heir, an ancestor on the throne as long as they are faithful to me. Now, David, we know, was rich and powerful, and his heart was committed to the Lord. Well, somebody said, well, I know some sins that David committed. That's not what we're talking about. Solomon was rich and powerful, and his heart was committed to the Lord. Somebody says, I know some sins that Solomon committed. Yes, David sinned. Yes, Solomon sinned, but they did not abandon the Lord. There's a difference between someone who is walking in the light as he is in the light and in fellowship with the Lord, and that person transgresses. There's a difference in that and the person who abandons the Lord, the person who turns their back on the Lord. So David was faithful to the Lord. Solomon was faithful to the Lord in spite of the sin that we see in their lives. And aren't we thankful for that? Because there's somebody we know kind of looks like that person we see in the mirror every day who did the same things that Solomon and David did in terms of sinning against the Lord. But Rehoboam now, unlike his grandfather David, unlike his father Solomon, this dude was wicked. And he was also foolish. He knew the ways of the Lord, but he refused to walk in them. Rehoboam had every opportunity to walk with God and enjoy the blessings that God wanted to display in his life. Remember, God is able to do and God wants to do far more than all we could ask or even imagine. Through his power that's at work within us, but man limits God's ability to do good things in our lives. Deuteronomy chapter 11, beginning at verse 16. God, as he speaks to Israel, he says, be careful, be careful, or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. The same message to us today. Be careful. Be careful or you will be enticed to turn away from God. We don't bow down and worship idols like they did. But we sin in very much the same way. When we give our attention, our focus, our priorities to anything or anyone but God, we have made an idol out of that thing, out of that person. That's idolatry. And God hates idolatry. Verse 17, he said, then the Lord's anger will burn against you, and he will shut up the heavens so that it will not rain, and the ground will yield no produce. That means famine, F-A-M-I-N-E, is coming. That means ain't nobody eating. There'll be a whole lot of people dying. So the Lord said to avoid that, verse 18, fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Now, I know we know how to fix stuff in our hearts and minds. When it comes to our social media, 
we fix that in our hearts and minds. And I know that by the amount of time we spend on social media. When it comes to sporting activities, whether we are a participant or, or, or a fan or an observer, we fix these activities in our hearts and minds. We like to watch our favorite teams, and we make sure, we make sure we don't miss kickoff time. We will lay everything else aside and make sure that we don't miss it. We fix these activities in our hearts and mind. So when the Lord says, fix my words in your heart and mind, we know what he's talking about. There's no way we'd miss out on some of the entertainment activities in our lives because we make it our business to show up on time, in time. We throw parties, social media parties, ball game parties. Everybody come over and share in this activity with me. I got chips, I got barbecue, I got sauce. Got every, everybody come over and celebrate. Now, when was the last time we invited everybody over, come over and celebrate the Lord with me? Come eat some barbecue as we celebrate the Lord. See how we forget about God? We get wrapped up in doing the things that we like to do, throw God off to the side. You know, we, we like to give God the spare change, give God the leftovers. We fix these activities in our minds because we don't want to miss out on them. God said, I want you to fix my word in your minds and in your hearts the very same way. And then he goes into details. He says, tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Put them on your door so you got to bump into it every day when you walk in your house. God is begging his people to remember him and remember the good things he's done in their lives. Rehoboam forgot about that. He knew better, but he forgot about that. Over and over again, throughout the history of God's people, when God presents before man, as Aubrey read earlier, he said, I present before you blessing and curse. You would think the choice would be easy. I'm going to choose blessing every time. But throughout history, over and over and over again, God said, choose blessing or curse. Man chooses curse. Every time. Remember what he said, the garden is yours. You got all these trees that you can eat from, and you will be blessed. Just don't mess with this one tree over here. One. Because if you do, you will be cursed. So what does man do? Go enjoy the many trees? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. The one tree that God said don't fool with, that's the one tree man goes after. Why choose cursing over blessing? Remember when God told Noah, he said, tell these folk, I'm going to make it rain. I'm going to drown everyone and everything. Preach to them, Noah. Noah's out there preaching. Bible called him a preacher of righteousness. And nobody but Noah's family. God said, all you got to do is step into the ark, that's all, and save yourself from destruction. This is blessing. This is curse. All you have to do is choose to be blessed. Why does God have to beg us and twist our arm up behind our back to get us to choose to receive his blessing? God is more patient than I am because I'd have been done with us. He told the Israelites, I'm going to bring you into the land of Canaan, the land of promise the land of milk and honey, the land of blessing. All you have to do is embrace the blessing I'm giving you. And yet of all the million plus, nearly two million people who left Egypt, only two made it into the land of promise. What does God have to do to get man to accept the blessing that he's trying to do in our lives? Sometimes God's children even though we know what's right, we've been taught what's right, God's children just won't do right. I'm talking about folk who grew up on God's word, folk who know the difference between right and wrong. Remember the high priest Aaron, Moses' brother? Two of his oldest sons, Nadab and Abihu, who should have grown up to be 
priest when Aaron died. But the Bible said these dudes, these knuckleheads, chose curse instead of blessing. And God killed both of them. We have Eli, the priest. Godly, godly man. Serving God with all his heart. But he had some sons who were knuckleheads. The Bible said these dudes were just wicked. Just no good. They knew the right that they should do. They knew that God offered them blessing and curse. And they chose curse. Yeah. And God did the same thing with them. Killed both of them. How many of us, if God operated the same way today? If God treated us as our sins deserved, how many of us would be here today? None of us. No, not one. one. Rehoboam, he lived a life of privilege because he was the son of a king. He was the grandson of a king. So he lived a life of privilege. But that life of privilege led to a prideful attitude. And that prideful attitude led to punishment from God. One of the main problems that Rehoboam had, he simply refused to give God the glory he deserves. God deserves glory. He deserves our best offering. He deserves our best sacrifice. Look at what he says in Malachi chapter 1. He said, a son honors his father. If I'm a father, where's the honor that's due me? A servant honors his master. If I'm a master, where is the honor that's due me? And then God says this, I wish you would shut the doors of the church so that nobody can come in and waste their time perpetrating a fraud. You imagine God walking in after we got through singing, Brother Abner leading us in, I love to praise him, and God walking in here saying, I don't want any of that. That was all phony. That's what he said in Malachi chapter 1. He said, shut the doors of the temple. I don't want to hear any of it. But if we sing it, oh, how I love Jesus, God said, I don't want to hear any of it. Yeah, Lord, have mercy indeed. The least we could do for all that God has done for us is give him the best that we have. That's what he says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. When he says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, total surrender to God is what he's asking. So the question for us is, does God get the glory he deserves from you? That's a question for personal reflection. Rehoboam operated in pride and complete disregard for God's word. In Rehoboam's mind, it was, God, thank you for the ride, but I can handle it from here. Yeah. That's pride. Somebody says, I would never say that. Yes, you would. Yes, you would. We may not say it with our mouth. We may not kick God off our train with our mouth. We may not say it with our lips. But what message does God get when he looks at our lives? We don't have to say a thing. All God has to do is look at our lives. I don't have to tell you I love you. You'll know whether I love you by the way I treat you. I don't have to tell you I hate you. You'll know whether or not I hate you by the way I treat you. We don't have to tell God, I don't want you riding with me. God will know by the way we live our lives. But too often God's children are sending him mixed messages. Our mouths are saying one thing, but our lives are saying something completely different. Guess which one God listens to most? Did you know that we could live our lives in such a way that God cannot bless us? That we cut off completely God's ability to do more than all we could ask or even imagine through his power that's at work within us. We can cut God off completely by the way we live our lives. Rehoboam was trifling in his relationship with God. 
God wants people to do the exact opposite of Rehoboam. Here's what God wants. He's looking for people who realize that without him, I would be nothing. Without him, I'd surely fail. Without him, I would be like a ship that's drifting without a sail. John chapter 15, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you cannot live. Apart from me, he says, you cannot live. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. The only reason I can do what I can do is because God gives me the strength to do it. Your version probably says I can do all things. Not because I'm strong. I can do all things because Christ strengthens me to do it. What God is looking for are those who desire to walk in obedience. John put it simple. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Isn't that what he said? Yeah. Is that simple? How can we claim to love God if we are not doing what he says? 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. No matter how much we sing, oh, how I love Jesus, I love to praise him, all of that don't mean nothing if we're not doing what he says to do. Amen. Verse 4, whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. Yes. That ain't me talking, that's the Bible. Yes. And the truth is not in that person. Wait, 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 what were you saying, preacher? And folks singing, oh, how I love Jesus every Sunday, and they're lying. That's what he said. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in that person. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. If our lives are contrary to the way Jesus lived, somebody's lying. No matter how well they sing, somebody's lying. No matter how well they teach, somebody's lying. No matter how well they preach, somebody's lying. No matter how well they do elder work, somebody is lying. And it's easy to fool one another. We can pull a fast one on each other. Every day, right, brother? But guess who we can't fool? Here's what God wants. He wants those who are all about Seeking and saving the lost. Luke chapter 19, Jesus said, that's what I came for. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. God saved us for blessing, not for cursing. However, however, now you know when you read however in a paragraph, that can change everything that was said before. God wants to bless us. God wants to do all that's good for us. God loves us. However, however changes things. When God's children refuse to walk in his ways, God will not hesitate to take his belt off. I remember I lived in the projects. I lived in the, in the dead center of the projects where the, the playground was, the basketball court and other stuff. Now, my mother never did this, but I've seen some other mothers come out. <laughs> come out in the house coat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hair looking like what? <laughs> they come out with a belt in their hair. We're playing basketball, run up and down full court. And we see Miss Johnson coming. Oh, <laughs> somebody's in trouble. Miss Johnson come walk right on the basketball court <laughs> and start swinging. <laughs> That's what God does. No matter how much God loves us and, desire, and desires to do good for us, if God's children refuse to walk in his ways, God is taking that belt off. God is going to work. Hebrews chapter 12, he said, those who I love, I rebuke and chasten. Those who I love, I rebuke and discipline. 
Some children grow up with the emotional pain of not having a mother's love. I was not one of those children. That's not my situation. I have no doubt that my mother loved me. No doubt about it. But part of that love was discipline. She beat me and my brothers, y'all. She beat us. Oh, oh she beat us. <laughs> That's back when we was young. I'm convinced that what she did to us, today they got laws against it. <laughs> but she did it. That's right. She had boys, exactly. I'm about the one about, about this high and about 90 pounds on a rainy day. But I watched her, my twin and I were about seven. My oldest brother was about, what's nine and seven? 16. We watched my, my, my little mother jump on him. And I mean, her little fist was just flying, flying, flying. And when you're seven years old, that does something to your mind. <laughs> Don't mess with her. She beat, she beat us. That's right, that's right. She beat us, but... We needed that. That's why today I'm a preacher, not a prisoner. That's why today I'm alive, not dead. God operates in very much the same way. He disciplines those he loves. If he didn't love us, he wouldn't discipline us. Psalms chapter 119, verse 71. David said, it was good for me to be afflicted. David said, it was good that God took his belt off and whooped my behind. He said, because it was then that I learned God's laws. It was then that I learned obedience. In verse 6 and 7, he said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But after God put that belt to my behind, David said, now I obey his word. God disciplines in many, many different ways. He uses this world, ungodly folk, to discipline his own children. Yeah. Just as he did with Rehoboam, he used the king of Egypt, a wicked nation, to discipline his own children. God operates in the same way today. He uses ungodly people to discipline his children. He uses sickness, physical illness, to discipline his children. He uses financial problems. He disciplines his children in a variety of ways. Rehoboam walked away from the Lord. Then he repented and he humbled himself. Every day we live, we live in battle with the enemy who never gives up the enemy is the world, the enemy is the flesh, the enemy is the devil. And the world wants to draw us into its pattern of behavior. That's why the apostle in Romans chapter 12 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Satan's over here saying, come on over, come join us. It's all good over here. And he's good at making it look good. But the apostle says, don't conform, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yeah. Then there's the flesh. The flesh wants to dominate us and keep us in slavery to its sinful desires. You know, Galatians chapter 5, when the apostle talks about sins of the flesh, the fruit of the spirit, the flesh wants to control us and dominate us and keep us from obeying God's divine will. So you got the world, you got the flesh, and then there's the devil himself. Yeah. We talked this morning in Bible class, his name is deceiver. Yeah. His name is adversary, and a whole lot of other names, but his job is to separate our hand from God's unchanging hand. And he is relentless, that means he never gives up. Thank God there's victory in Jesus for those who will look to him for the help they need. Remember the Apostle Paul? He said, I love God, but I'm torn between what God wants me to do and what I want to do. 
what the flesh wants me to do, what the world wants me to do, what the devil wants me to do. And you ask yourself, how could somebody like the Apostle Paul go through that kind of struggle? Not only did he go through that kind of struggle, he said, man, I'm a sinful dude. What? You? Not only am I sinful, but I'm the chief of sinners. I'm the biggest one out here. But he cries out in Romans chapter 7. Praise be to God, there's victory in Jesus, my Savior, forever. Take a look at your life this morning. And ask yourself, are you growing in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ? And if not, why not? The Bible gives us the example of Rehoboam for a reason. A man who knew the Lord. He knew God's way and he chose. In spite of, remember his grandfather, David, a man after God's own heart. His father Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs and all those wise sayings that if we follow will keep us out of all kinds of trouble in this life. And still, he chose not to walk with God. The Lord. So ask yourself about your relationship with God. And is it growing as it should? Because if we're not growing in grace, we're sliding backwards. There ain't no sitting still. Amen. In our relationship with God, there's drive and reverse. That's it. Yes. There ain't no neutral gear. Yes. If we're not growing in Christ, we are falling away from him. And if this morning you need the prayers and the help of the church in your walk with God, please make it known.